Good morning and welcome to the service with a difference. It is the 6th of October 2024. We are in the season of discipleship and we started the season off by looking at the question, who, who is Jesus? And we have now gone on to a new series. Um, two weeks ago, we, we started looking at the question, who are we then as believers of Jesus? Who are we as those who trust that Jesus is our Lord and our, and our Savior? Um, who are we as, as Christians? And we, we, we looked two weeks ago at how we are human. We experience the same thing that everybody else experiences. Everybody who is following Jesus experiences the same things that everybody who is not following Jesus experiences. The difference is um, the way in which we respond to those experiences, the way that we should respond to those experiences at least. Um, and last week we, we looked at how we are a body. So as Christians, as believers, we all form a part of the body of, of Christ. And we bring the same kind of healing into this world that Jesus brought into this world. Or again, at least we should bring the same kind of healing and the same kind of life and the same kind of redemption into this world that Jesus did. We introduce people to Jesus so that Jesus can do the work of, of saving, that he can do the work of, of redeeming. We are the church. We're not always going to agree. It's not always going to be hunky-dory. We're not going to get along because people are involved. And when people are involved, there is differences of opinion. There is fractures. But the one thing we all agree on is that we are in love with God and we want to do whatever God is calling us to do in front of us in this moment. And today we are looking at how, as believers, as Christians, we, we are a people of relationship. People are not there to be abused. People are not there to be to be used for what we can get out of them. We, we are there to be in a relationship with people because the God who created us, the God who saved us, is a God who just wants to be in relationship with us. Out of that relationship blossoms life and blossoms hope and blossoms, blossoms joy. Today we, we are reading from Psalm 8, and, and in Psalm 8, it's just it's such an incredible psalm in which, in which the psalmist is marveling at how this God who called all of creation into being, this God who, who is so majestic, this God would, would love and honor imperfect humans in the way that he does. This is just, this is so incredible. It's mind-blowing. The psalmist can't, can't get their head around the way in which God would love us in the way that he does when God is God and we are so, so far removed from, from God. Um, and then we're also going to be reading from Genesis chapter 2. We're going to read from verse 18 to, to verse 24. Um, God has created everything, put man in charge of it. Um, he created man, um, and I'm using the word man loosely, human, in his, in his image, um, but saw that human was lonely and and none of the animals that God created could be a partner with human in, in the work that God had placed before him. And so God separates the human, male and, and female. He separates man, male and female. And so together, the two are that which is created in the image of God. And, and they will come together, says God, and the two will be one again. Um, and obviously, it's speaking about marriage. And then that takes us to Mark chapter 10. We're going to read from verse 2 to verse 16 where the Pharisees come to Jesus and they're trying to test Jesus. They ask him about divorce um, and when is it good to divorce and when is it not good to divorce. And after that conversation, Jesus opposes them, he corrects them. And then again, the conversation with the children. Um, people are wanting to bring children to, to Jesus, to be blessed by Jesus. And the disciples are getting miffed with us. They, they are chasing the children away. And Jesus says, bring the children, children to me. And again, I'm going to ask that you put this on pause as you first read through, through those readings. And as we read through them, we give God thanks for them. And we pray that he will bless them to us as we reflect on them in, in this moment. In today's reading, the Pharisees come to Jesus and, and they are asking him about divorce. They want to know from Jesus which school of thought he subscribes to. Because at the time of, of Jesus in the Pharisees, there were there were two main schools of thought. Um, the one was Hillel, the house of Hillel, and the other was the, the house of, of Shammai. And, and in the house of Hillel, divorce was permissible for any reason. Even if the woman burnt toast, a man was allowed a divorce. And in the house of Shammai, 
um, divorce was only permissible in the case of adultery. And so the Pharisees want to see which house Jesus subscribes to. And, and at the time, especially amongst the upper class um, Israelites, and that includes obviously the, the Sadducees and, and some of the Pharisees, marriage was, was understood to be a legal contract rather than, than a spiritual contract. Um, marriages were arranged um, much like the royals of the century past, marriages were arranged to amass wealth and to amass power and to amass status. W women were seen as as belongings and their worth depended on the value of their family, you know, the, the value of their family's property and, and their wealth and their status. Divorce then became the means by which a man was able to exchange one, one source of wealth for a bigger source of wealth. In other words, he was kind of like upgrading and, and, and bringing more wealth into, into his family and into his family's property. And that's why in Deuteronomy chapter 24, from verse 1 to verse 4, Moses orders the Israelites to give a certificate of divorce so that the woman who is divorced wouldn't be stranded. Um, if somebody wanted to, to marry her and take her in, they, they would be able to do that. Um, and obviously the original husband wasn't then allowed to marry this woman after her husband died because then for him it would just be a means of gaining the second husband's wealth. And so in this whole conversation, the Pharisees are wanting to test to see where Jesus stands, which school of thought, as I said earlier, Jesus, Jesus subscribes to. And, and Jesus confronts their failed understanding of relationship. And, and straight after that, he has to confront the disciples' bias towards Jewish males. And and obviously the conversation with the children and the disciples are chasing the children away. The conversation about who is the greatest is is still ongoing. Um, Jesus, the last time they had this conversation, he brings a child to to him amongst them, and he, and he and he embraces the child and says, "The one who welcomes this child welcomes me. The one who welcomes me welcomes the one who who sent me." And so Jesus had the conversation about what it means to be great in the kingdom of God, but the disciples haven't understood that. They they are, for all intents and purposes, a product of their time. They have to wrestle against everything that they have they have come to understand as, as true. Um, and so his response to the disciples is that children are not a burden um, to be carried. They are a part of the community. And, and as children, they add value to the community. When Jesus answers the Pharisees and, and when he responds to the disciples, he, he speaks about what it means to be in a loving relationship with all of God's people. What it means to be in a loving relationship with, with, with God himself. It's, it's a relationship of love. It's not a, a, it's not a legal obligation to be in a relationship with God. There is no legal obligation in our relationship with God. There is no legal obligation in our relationship with, with other people. Because as believers, we are a people of of relationship and we we have a relationship with the community of believers that surround us we have a relationship with with in fact the whole world that surrounds us whether they believe in god or not and so jesus answers the pharisees question but he but he answers the real question he he speaks about god's original design for marriage rather than speaking about the legalities of divorce jesus jesus doesn't adhere to any of the schools of thought that the Pharisees are able to present to him. And, th and that's because Jesus as adheres to the school of thought of life being love and life only having meaning when life is founded in, in relationship with, with people. The ideal marriage to God is a community of trust. And this is what we find in Adam and Eve. There was one human and God separated the male and female. And so only when they come back to together in in that union, are they then the human that was created in the image of God? And so it's only when we are in a healthy relationship with each other are we able to help each other back into the into the nature of, of God. Because we, we we created in his image, but we don't we don't share his nature. And so our journey on, on the way to perfection is to is to to relearn the nature of God, to 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 come back to our initial creation, what God meant, or what God intended when, when he created us in the first place. And so for God, the ideal marriage is a community of trust. It's a community of accountability. It's a community of mutual submission in which children are able to be born and, and where they can be nurtured within this safe, edifying environment. And, and this is difficult for us when we, when we come into a relationship with, 
insecurities, when we come into a relationship with fears, when we come into a relationship with, with a rebellious spirit. But it's a process in which we choose to love each other and in which we choose to teach each other how, how we need to be loved. It, it's, it's not about getting, it's not about winning, it's not about power, it's not about who is the greatest in a relationship. It's about a willingness to, to give. It's about a willingness to work with each other, to serve each other as we, as we build each other up, as we help each other grow back into the nature of, of God. And that's a part of the conversation that Jesus is having with, with the disciples because they, they see themselves in a, a, a position of power. They, they see themselves as having authority over the children. And so they want to chase the children away because to them children are, are nothing. And Jesus is saying, no, that's not who we are. We, we are a people of, of relationship. And, and when we recognize that no one has any power over anybody else, but we all are expected to add value to, to the whole, that's, that's when we are returning into the nature of God, when we build each other up because we, we recognize our responsibility towards each other in this relationship that we are able to, to, to draw each other on to being perfected in, in love. And, and when we don't work at that, when we don't work at our relationships, that's when the possibility of adultery is, is opened. Anyone or anything that comes between our relationship is, is adulterous. You know, when anything takes the place of affection, when anything takes the place of intimacy, that is what adultery is. The Pharisees are getting caught up in the details, but, but Jesus speaks of, of the reality of being created in community and being created for community. He, his response takes us beyond economics and takes us beyond the contractual agreements that exist in relationships. He reminds us that families are an integral part of our human identity. This is, this is who we are created to be. And, and, and he opposes the Pharisees perpetuating the thought that, that women can be considered property, that, that, that the value of women lies in their economic power. Um, he, he opposes the Pharisees perpetuating the thought that it is permissible to, to trade up. Adultery is, is not a property issue. Adultery is, is a matter of, of accountability. Jesus speaks about taking care of of those who are most vulnerable. He speaks about taking care of, of women. He speaks about taking care of, of children because those are the most vulnerable amongst us. And that's true also for, for families who are going through divorce. Divorce is never the ideal. It's not the ideal. It is though for us a testimony of our need to be in community because when a marriage fails, everyone, everyone is hurt. The couple is hurt, the family is hurt, the community that surrounds that family is, is hurt. There is, there is even pain when it seems as if the divorce is the best available option. God is hurt by divorce, and he's hurt by divorce not only because of the breakdown in, in the covenant. He is hurt by divorce because, because his children are hurting, because his, his children are in pain. And so God is still present with those who are involved in divorce. And, and he continues to bring them healing. He continues to bring them encouragement, continues to bring them um, consolation. He, he continues to help them mourn as they need to mourn. And so as a community of people who, who believe in, in Christ and in the healing love of God, that, that God is, is only wanting to be in a relationship with us and, and bring healing to his children, as a community who believe that, as a com community who want to join with God in what God is doing, we, we need to be the place where we are able to take care of those who are hurting. We need to be that place where we are able to, to take care of those who need the healing that we are able to testify to. Being a believer in Jesus is not about keeping some or other list of, of regulations, not about marking off on a page who is right and who is wrong. It's about being human. And it's about being in a genuine relationship with, with other humans. People, people are not a means to an end, but they are created in the image of God. They are sacred and they need to be treated as sacred. And so as, as a community of faith, as people who subscribe to, to, to the teachings of Christ, as people who, who trust that Jesus is our Lord and our Savior, as Christians, we are called to be a people of relationship. We are called to relate with, with God's children and we are called to relate with, with God.
the Pharisees, their, their willingness to, to negotiate these laws and, and all the other laws that, that Jesus confronts. Um, we spoke a couple of weeks ago about, about Corbin. It tells us that their relationship with God is, is an issue of legalities. And it's, and it's about working out where they can find loopholes in the system. If you are spending your time looking for loopholes in a relationship of trust, then you are not really in a relationship of trust. Marriage, like, like every other relationship of trust, doesn't work on its own. It takes work. It takes effort. Each partner needs to take responsibility for the relationship that exists. It takes the same kind of commitment with regards to our faith and, and our growth in, in our love for God. You know, it's an ongoing effort to be open to a, to a growing and a maturing relationship with God. It's a lifetime commitment of learning to love as God loves. And, and we are committed to that simply because we, we love God and, and we, we love others. Our motivation is love. And, and if we are not working on our relationship with God, that also opens us up to, to adultery. You know, that's, that's when we have other gods and anything that we can't do without, anything, anything that, that rules us, anything that has power over us, anything that we are addicted to, anything we can't let go of, anything that interferes in our relationship with God or anything that interferes in our worship of God is, is another God. And when we have other gods, we are adulterous. Because we are not giving ourselves completely to, to God. And so our journey of faith is about learning to let go of everything that is not God so that we can embrace everything that is of God. And you will know that, that every relationship we commit to changes who we are. And, and that is the same in our relationship with God. As Christians, we, we have left, left our past behind us. Genesis chapter 2, God says, this man will, will leave his mother and father. He'll leave his past behind him. Take his wife and the two will be, become one. And so we have left our past behind us. We have started a new life with Christ. And, and there's a great amount of ongoing adjustment as we, as we learn to, to live into that relationship that we have with Christ. But, but it's about letting go of the old and embracing who we are in, in Christ. And as we continue to wrestle with what it means to believe is we know that being in a relationship with God automatically draws us into a relationship with others. And it's, and it's not always, we know it's not always with others that we necessarily want to be with. You know, part of, part of the wrestle is that our worlds are not in line with God's will. We don't see things the same way God sees them. We don't see people in the same way that God sees them. And, and even though we get it wrong, even though we fail, even though we forget the passion of our first love with God, God doesn't forget. And, and we are God's creation. He will, he will always seek for our best because he loves us perfectly. Don't, don't mock God by looking for the legalities in, in his love. He loves us because of who he is. Simply, simply love him back. Love his other children because that's, that's who he created us to be. As Christians, as believers, we are a people of relationship. Be in relationship for the sake of relationship. Don't be in relationship for the sake of how it's going to benefit you at the expense of other people. Just, just love people because that's who we are in God. Pray with me. Lord God, you, you know our difficulties with relationships. And so we ask that you would have mercy on us for those times that we, we viewed others as less than you created them to be. Forgive us. For those times where we have viewed ourselves as anything less than sacred. We can see our failure to treat others as sacred by the sheer volume of hurt and suffering that surrounds us everywhere. And so Lord God, for the way in which we turn a blind eye, for the way in which we determine our own truth, especially when that truth is at the expense of other people, for, for the way in which we, we destroy everything that you have gifted us with for the sake of our, our own security and greed, have mercy on us, Lord God. For every time we, we have entered into a relationship because it is purely a strategic move, have mercy on us. For every time we have failed to love purely because you have taught us how to love, have mercy on us. Hear us, Lord, as we pray this in your precious, precious name. Amen.